Hi, in this video, we are going to discuss on electronically steered phased array antennas. This is uh, the part one of module four, the last topic. Uh, we'll also discuss on what is uh, about the radiation patterns of phased array, uh, the expression for array factor, which we have uh, gone through last semester also. And then we'll also see about uh, two dimensional radiation pattern. So let us start with uh, what is electronically steered phased array antennas. So a phased array antenna is usually a directive antenna. Okay. So it's a directive antenna made up of individual antennas that is radiating elements. So we have seen what is array of antenna, array of isotropic elements in the last semester in antennas. And we also saw broadside array and fire array. Right? And we saw the radiation patterns of them. And we also saw n element uh, arrays. And then we, uh, we saw the expressions for uh, field intensity. Correct? So now there's a difference between those uh, regular arrays and phased arrays, okay? which are electronically steered phased arrays. So we'll see what that is. So if you see what, if you want to see what is, how is the arrangement, it is similar to them. Okay, so the phased array is a directive antenna. So combined radiation pattern is going to be one beam, right? So like that of a directive antenna. So even though the elements are many, the combined radiation pattern is going to be one single directive uh, radiation pattern, correct? So that's why it is a directive antenna, but it is made up of individual radiating elements, okay? Or radiating antenna. So the radiation pattern, Okay, so the uh, radiation pattern which is generated by these phased arrays whose shape uh, has shape and direction which is determined by what? Relative phases and the amplitudes of the current which is applied to the individual radiating elements or the antennas. Okay, so uh, that is uh, what is meant by feeding. So what is exactly fed to these antenna elements? So what, whatever is fed to these antenna elements, that would determine what is the shape and direction of the radiation pattern. Okay, so we'll see what are the different types of feeds that can be given and in what all ways can the feeds be given to the individual radiating elements. So based on these feeds, that is the phases and the amplitudes of the currents which are applied to the individual radiating elements, we get the uh, corresponding uh, radiation pattern with a specific shape and a direction, okay. Now, so how do we steer the direction? So we know that if you apply really, uh, different phases and uh, amplitudes of the currents to those uh, antenna elements, you are going to get a definite radiation pattern in one particular direction and with a particular beam width, correct? But then how to steer the direction of that uh, radiation pattern? That is by changing the relative phases. So by properly varying the relative phases, we can steer the direction of the radiation. For that also, I'll give you a proper figure, which will give you a better understanding. So, so we know when we keep arrays, there should be some uh, space between them. So all the antenna elements, those individual radiating elements are going to be spaced uh, equally, okay? So with respect to one another. That is usually we see D, right? Small D. So whatever we have learned, so common geometrical forms of antenna arrays, what are they? One is linear array, and one is planar array, right? Um, let's see. Yeah. So uh, what is linear array? So it is uh, antenna elements which are arranged in a straight line. Okay, so that is one dimensional array, so which we have seen in the previous semester. So like the broadside array or the infrared array, which we had seen, okay. Uh, now, and also we saw the linear array, which can be used as a feed for parabolic cylinder antenna in the previous video. Now, planar array. Planar array is the same linear array when it is arranged in two dimension configuration. We get planar array. That means it is a linear array of linear arrays okay so when these linear arrays are placed in two dimensions okay so we get planar array okay 
So in both these linear and planar arrays, the element spacings here, small d, should be uniform. That means it should be equal, correct? Yeah. So usually most of the phased arrays are planar, okay? Now, we have seen in previous uh, semester what is broadside and infrared. So broadside is when it has the direction of radiation pattern perpendicular to the uh, uh, plane of the antenna, correct? So there is an axis where the antenna is kept. The radiation pattern will be perpendicular to it, right? So if the axis of antenna is here, so suppose we have two point sources, right? So the radiation pattern is going to be like this for broadside. For N5, it is going to be like this, correct? Yeah. So that was all what we have learned. Okay. Now, another two terms which you should know is electronically scanned array. So that is also the same array in which relative phase shift between the elements is controlled by. So that's what we are going to see. Okay. So the phase when it is when the phase. So when when do we get phase array? Uh, which can be steered when we have relative phase difference, phase shift differences between the individual elements. So when it is controlled by electronic devices, it is called as electronically scanned array. Next is conformal array where uh, the antenna elements are distributed on a non-planar cell. Okay, so this we are not going to see in this module. It's just for you to know that what is this. Okay, so conformal array. So next is, next topic is radiation patterns of phase terror. Okay. So consider this figure where we have N element linear array. So forget about how the feeding is given. For now, just know that <clears throat> there are different techniques, but then in this figure, it is parallelly feed, parallelly fed. Okay. So the individual antennas, that is one, two, three, and so on till N. Okay. This is a linear array. It is not planar array. Okay, so we will restrict our study to plan a linear array for now. Okay, and then we'll come to two dimensional version. So this is linear array of n, n elements, which is parallelly fed. Okay, so you can see all of them are fed together here. Okay. So the same point is going to be uh, receiving also, the same point is going to be feeding also. Okay. So and another thing is you can see the spacing between them, that is small d is supposed to be equal right so it is equal so with uh, equal lengths of transmission lines okay between each antenna element this also so all these uh, transmission lines lengths should also be equal and supposing that these antenna elements are working as uh, receivers so the incoming signal is coming in this direction now the output okay so the out antenna output is going to be at this point okay so ea okay so now so consider this structure of linear arrays n element linear array which is parallelly fed with equal lengths equal spacing between each individual array and then outputs of outputs which are received in all these n elements are summed up okay uh, and then it is taken via all these lengths of transmission lines and then they produce a Mm, some output voltage that is EA. Now here element one that is this element. Okay, so this element that is element number one is going to be the reference which has zero phase. So we saw last time that you can have two point sources in this manner. So one element here, one element here, and the spacing between them is going to be D, same D, right? In that case, the reference is going to be at the center of this, center of the two antennas, okay, here at D1. So when incoming signal is like this, the phase difference between them, the extra distance traveled by the incoming signal to antenna number one, so this is one and two, is going to be this. So if the reference is this, we consider like this, correct? So, so like, Okay, so if the reference is this, we consider this point, correct? Now you can draw the same thing in different manner, like this also. So antenna number one is placed at the reference, antenna number two is here. So this is one and this is two. In that case, the reference is going to be at this point. So, and then the extra distance traveled is this. 
okay so here this is d by 2 and here this is d by 2 okay so yeah so the extra distance traveled with respect to the reference for 2 is this okay and then for 1 is this like that okay so but that is in case antenna number one is not the reference. The center of these two antennas is itself the reference. But in this case, antenna number one is the reference and hence, what will happen? It will have zero phase because this is the reference, correct? Yeah, so in this case, assume this condition. Okay, yeah. So, <coughs> yeah. so we assume that the antenna, that is the, sorry, incoming signal are arriving at an angle theta with respect to the normal of the antenna. So this is the normal of the antenna, right? So with respect to the normal of the antenna, the signals are arriving at an angle theta. And hence the extra distance traveled, this one here. What is this? This is going to be d sine theta, right? So this is going to be this one is going to be d sine theta, right? So now this d sine theta is the extra distance travel. Now when you can write this in terms of phase difference between the adjacent elements, how do you write it? You write it as phi is equal to, so beta d sine theta, correct? So beta into d sine theta gives the phase difference. And then what is beta? 2 pi by lambda. So the same thing can be written as 2 pi by lambda into d sine theta. 2 pi by lambda into d sine theta becomes what the phase difference between the adjacent elements that is phi where lambda is the wavelength of the received signal okay so this is how this is how we get the phase difference okay now so in the last semester we saw uh, I'll, yeah i'll just tell you what this figure is so this is this figure shows the basic difference so this is from here now, so I've got the screenshot from Google. So, this figure shows the basic difference between a regular array, an isotropic element, and a regular array and a phase term. So, suppose we have an isotropic element that is just one element, one antenna element. Okay, so this is just one antenna element. So, what is an isotropic element? So assuming the XYZ uh, coordinate system. Okay, so, so this is Z, X, and Y. Okay, so the antenna point is assumed to be placed here. So isotropic element is the one which radiates equally in all the direction, correct? So it has basically a spherical radiation pattern, sphere, okay? Uh, but that is not existing, so, right? So isotropic is just a reference, so it doesn't exist in reality. So if you assume an antenna element is isotropic, that means its response, or you can take it as amplitude or uh, field E, okay? It is equal in all the direction, so x-axis is direction. That's why you have a straight line. This is not directive antenna, correct? So it radiates equally in all the direction. But when you combine three isotropic antennas, antenna elements, the okay, combiner. So when you combine three different isotropic antenna elements, you're going to get the combined radiation pattern is going to be directive, okay? Like this. You can see the beam width is little more here. Okay, side lobes are less though. Okay, now if the antenna elements are increased, okay, but even the single antenna elements are isotropic elements. If the antenna elements are increased, you're going to get a better directive radiation pattern like this. So we know exactly at this at which point it is going to radiate. So the, this is the point where the directivity is higher. Okay, so that is about the array of antennas. Now when it is phased array, you're going to give different phase shapes. So there are many ways, two ways uh, where feed can be given. One is one of them is giving a uh, feeding with different phase shifts in each antenna element. Okay, so when that is done, what are you getting? You're get, going to get the same radiation pattern, but it is steerable. Okay, so you can change the direction. <clears throat> okay, so that is phase step. Understood? Yeah. So we were talking about yeah, this one. So, uh, okay, this you can make it as phi. Okay, so in textbook it is phi, phi. So phi is equal to two pi d by lambda sine theta. So this is the phase difference between adjacent elements. Okay, 
Now, in the previous semester, we saw how do we take the sum of all the voltages from the individual antenna elements, assuming there is a phase difference phi between them. So, how do we write it? So, theta is the direction of incoming radiation. Yeah. So, sum of all the voltages becomes this. So, in the previous semester, we have written in terms of E, E power J psi. So, assuming this, this plus E power 2J psi, like that, plus E power. 1 plus sorry, 1 plus e power j psi, 2 j psi, e power 3 j psi and so on like that. Correct? So 1 is e power 0. So this term. e power j psi is this like that. So the same can be written in terms of sine. Okay. So it's the same thing. So this is what we have studied in the previous semester. Plus etc. plus e power j n minus 1 psi like that. Correct? No? Yeah. So in, in our textbook, it is not psi. So I have put psi because psi is what we learned in previous semester, I guess. So here for our uh, textbook, you should replace it with phi. Okay. Fine. Yeah. So sine omega t plus sine omega t plus psi plus sine omega t plus 2 psi, etc. So this is, uh, this you might be similar. Yeah, I mean, you might know this. Okay. So this is the sum of all the voltages between when phase difference psi is available between the adjacent elements. Okay. So what is omega? It is the angular frequency of the signal. Now the total sum. So when you sum up this, so we saw we saw the derivation. So we have learned about the derivation of this in the previous semester, right? So you get what you get this expression. So finally you will get this expression sine by sine form. Remember. So sin omega t plus n minus 1 psi by 2, sin n psi by 2 by sin psi by 2. So this first factor, this one, this is a sine wave with frequency omega and a phase shift of n minus 1 psi by 2. So this express, this term is coming into picture because we have taken element 1 as the reference which is placed here. Element 2 is here, element 3 is here like this. So if we were taking the center of the array like this, so Element 1 is here, 2 is here, 3 is, 3 is here, 4 is here. So if the center is taken as the reference, this expression is not, this term is not going to appear in this expression. Okay. So this also I think we have learned in last semester. This, when this expression comes, that is because reference 1, element, antenna element 1 is placed at the reference point. Okay. Otherwise, if we take the center of the array as the reference, this, this term is not going to appear. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, this term is not so important. This is more important. Okay, so this term is the one which is going to give you how the field intensity pattern is going to be. The shape of the radiation pattern is going to be. So when you take the magnitude of this expression Ea, what are you going to get? So the magnitude of that expression is going to give you this. Okay, so in this we have substituted the value of phi. Okay, here that is uh, 2 pi d by lambda sine theta is substituted here. So when you substitute that in the like in the previous expression, when you substitute for this phi, you know, 2 pi d by lambda sine theta, that 2, 2 gets cancelled, like, and you get this expression. So this expression, when you, uh, when you substitute 0, theta equal to 0. So we are assuming x. So this is z. This is x. And this is y, correct? So along z axis, your theta is going to be 0. Okay. So assuming our array elements are here, fine. Like this, not, okay, center is not the reference. So we have placed antenna number 1 itself at the center. Okay. So theta equal to 0 is here. So when you substitute theta equal to 0, you're going to get 0 by 0 form, which is indeterminate. Okay. So when numerator is 0, you're going to get field intensity pattern as 0. So when does this occur? It occurs at theta equal to 0. <coughs> it can also occur at theta equal to plus or minus pi, 2 pi, etc. N pi, basically. So same is the case with denominator also, correct? So that is indeterminate form 0 by 0. So by applying Lopita's rule, you should be differentiating the numerator and denominator separately. And then you will get the maxima. Okay, so that's how we did we did this in the previous semester, right? How to find maxima? We have integrated, sorry, differentiated numerator and 
denominator separately and then we have found out what is the maximum value so we are not going to see the derivation for now okay so we're just seeing what is so we basically got 1 by n as the maximum if you remember okay yeah i'll come back to this figure later yeah uh, Mm, yeah, okay, let me come back to this itself. Yes, so 1 by n was the uh, maximum value. Now, another thing you have to know is <clears throat> about grating loops. Okay, so I'll get back to that expression. Okay, so this is how we get the maximum by integrating, sorry, differentiating the numerator and denominator. Okay, so there is something called as grating loops. Okay, so grating loops is one disadvantage. So even though we get maximum at theta equal to zero, okay, so at theta equal to zero, you're going to get the maximum value like this. Okay, <clears throat> but there are some other theta values also where you're going to get the maximum value. So other maximas are called as grating loops. So they are going to be of the same magnitude as that of the main beam, which is appearing here. Okay, it could be like this here, like this. So we will see what is that. So I think last time we have derived uh, expressions of uh, other maximas, other minimas, right? You remember like that. So other maximas will also sometimes have the same magnitude as that of main beam. So these are called as grating loops. So this is not desirable. Okay, so this will cause ambiguity in the target detection. Okay, so now how do we ignore or avoid grating loops? Now this is the figure of uh, phased array antennas. Uh, that is planar phase. You can see one line is linear array. Similarly, when say, many lines are kept, that becomes two-dimensional. That is planar array. Okay, and the spacing between them should be equal. This is how a phased array will look like. Okay, so this is the close-up view, and this is the broader, like far away view. Okay, yeah. So there are so many antenna elements which has to be fed. <coughs> okay, like this. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So grating loops. Okay, now, <clears throat> now you can see what is the separation here. So this is when d is equal to lambda by 4. One second. This is when d is equal to lambda by 2 and this is when d is equal to lambda separation. So assuming that uh, elements are kept in this direction and your pattern is going to be like this. So this is broadside, okay. So antenna, the pattern is going to be perpendicular to the array axis, correct? If the antenna elements are placed in this direction, you uh, time it. So this is a donut shaped pattern that is broadsided. So when you cut it like this, you're going to get, get it like this, right? So when you cut it like this, okay. yeah, one second. <coughs> so <coughs> now how to avoid these grating loops? So what is grating loop? So when the separation between the antenna element is uh, lambda by four, you can see the maxima is at this point. So that is theta equal to angle of broadside, okay? Theta equal to zero. The maxima is here, okay? Seven dBi, no problem. Gain, okay? Fine. Now when the, where D is lambda by two separation, you can see the side lobes have increased, okay? Uh, and maxima is at theta equal to zero itself. Okay, and the gain is increased, that is 10 dBi. Now, when d is equal to lambda separation, when the separation is lambda, you can see the maxima is at theta equal to zero, that is 10 dBi. But you can also see other maximas at other places, which is at, uh, to be exact, it is uh, minus 90 and plus 90, that is theta equal to 90 and uh, minus 90. That means, so this is the maxima, <clears throat> that is theta equal to zero. So at theta equal to 90 and minus 90, you're going to get again some other maximas. When the, 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 the safe spacing between the antenna elements is lambda. Okay, so this is not desired, right? So what did we know now? If we can understand that if the spacing is changed, so if you keep D lesser than lambda, lesser than equal to lambda also is fine, then you can avoid the grating loops. So you can see the grating loops are not there in these two spacings, <coughs> right? So if you keep d less less than or equal to lambda, you're going to get you're going you're not you're not going to get the grating loops. So the grating loop is at plus or minus ninety is uh, <coughs> is the grating loop here, which you can see. Okay. So uh, now suppose your antenna is okay. This is the antenna array, right? 
So your antenna is like this, and you're going to, according to this figure, your pattern is like this, correct? So you can see um, at d equal to lambda, you're going to get the maxima at this point. That is theta equal to 90 and plus 90, minus 90 and plus 90. Now, usually, uh, now, yeah, now next expression. Now this expression, e of theta is equal to ea of uh, pi minus theta. What does this equation indicate? It means that the array of this isotropic elements, they have similar pattern in the rear of the antenna as in the front, like this. So rear of the antenna is this part, back side. If the antenna is facing in this direction, so the desired antenna is uh, radiation pattern is this. This is the opposite, correct? No. So at the back of the antenna also, you're going to get the same pattern. See this, this is the front, this is the back. So in the back also, you're going to get the same pattern, which is actually not required. Right, so array of dipole antenna also, you're going to get the same thing, okay? Now to avoid this, okay, what we do is, we place a reflecting, uh, one reflector here or a reflecting screen, if we place here, this pattern can be avoided. So we want only this front pattern. Okay, so usually we'll consider the pattern only in this plane. Okay, one second. Yeah, so I'll just draw once more. So if, <clears throat> I'll draw it here. Okay. So if antenna elements are placed in this axis and you're going to get a pattern here in this axis, and if the spacing is so yeah, the spacing is d equal to lambda, you're going to get a grating lobe at this axis, which is 90. So this is theta equal to zero, which is our desired pattern. So we don't need this back pattern, right? So we place a reflector in order to avoid this pattern. But then grating lobes, what to do? So we usually consider this plane only from here to here. That is, we consider theta equal to minus 90 to 2 plus 90. So we consider only this plane when we do the calculations. Okay, so basically this grating lobe is actually not considered. So even if you keep d is equal to lambda spacing, we are not considering this. Okay. So only the forward half of the array antenna, that is minus 90 to plus 90 theta, should be, we need to be considered. Okay, so, so hence, even if you keep d is equal to lambda, that grating lobes can be tolerated because that uh, 90 and plus 90 is actually not considered in the calculations of theta. Okay, so that's how it is. Now, yeah, I'll just clear it. So now this, this equation indicates that the pattern in the front of the antenna array is same to the pattern behind the antenna array. So we remove that by keeping a reflecting surface, clear? So this radiation pattern is equal to normalized square of the amplitude. That is called as array factor. So the normalized radiation pattern of an array of isotropic antennas, uh, which is sometimes called as antenna factor or also called a space factor. It is given by this expression. So I told you n, one by n is going to be the maximum value, correct? So when you take the magnitude, normalized version, you're going to get Ea square by n square. So Ea square, because we are, this is, e, e is uh, related to voltage. When you need power pattern, you'll usually square it, okay? So that's why it is squared here. So it is just the square of this expression, which we saw in the previous slide, okay? Here, N, capital N into D, capital N into D is actually equal to capital D, which is the antenna dimension. Okay. Yeah. Now, now if the spacing between, assume the spacing between the antenna elements that is small d is equal to lambda by two. Okay, and in the and if the sign in the denominator is replaced by its argument, that means assume the theta value is very small, so sine theta becomes almost equal to theta itself. That's what is said here. If sine in the denominator is replaced by its argument, that is theta itself, then we get the half power beam width of this um, array as 102 by n. Okay, so capital N is what the number of antenna elements which is sufficiently large. Okay. Now, all the, in all these cases, we assumed that each antenna element is isotropic. Correct. Now, if the antenna elements are not isotropic, what do we get? We get pattern multiplication, you remember? For non-isotropic antenna elements, we are going to get 
pattern multiplication as we saw in the previous semester. So assume all the individual antenna elements are directive instead of being isotropic. So what do we get? We get such a pattern. So we just saw in the previous slide this one, this GA. <clears throat> so this is the array factor when the total uh, antenna array factor when each antenna element is isotropic. So remember this GA. So when individual antenna elements are directive, then we get a combination of GE and GA, where GE is element factor. That means individual pattern of single antenna element, and then the array factor of the combined antenna elements. So when so this is only pattern multiplication, which we have seen in the previous semester. So suppose the antenna is having a sine theta pattern. So you'll get a sine theta pattern, GE. And the combined pattern gives you one broadside pattern. So the combination, the total radiation pattern would be multiplication of that those two. Okay. So basically it is element factor into array factor. That is, this is what is pattern multiplication, which we have learned in the previous semester. So the total pattern is <coughs> element pattern into array factor. Okay. So when we have to, so this was all when we considered linear array, that is one dimensional antenna pattern, antenna array. So when it is two dimensional, you will have uh, the array factor in azimuth plane, elevation plane into array factor in the azimuth plane, correct? So it need not be azimuth and elevation exactly. It can be any two orthogonal planes also. So the factor in two different orthogonal planes when multiplied, you are going to get the total pattern for a two dimensional antenna, uh, two dimensional antenna. Okay. So that's the two dimensional pattern. And then so the same expression when you have to write it separately, like the previous, uh, this expression. Okay. So it becomes like this. So science, the so same two expression. Okay. Sign N psi by two by sine psi by 2, the square of it, and then this, where n is the number of elements in 1, and m is the number of elements itself, okay, fine, so that is in uh, azimuth plane, and one is in elevation plane, or, or you can take two different orthogonal planes, that's it, the number of vertical, so if you take, if you not exact, if you don't exactly take this as you put an elevation, you can consider n as the number of vertical columns of the array that gives one, uh, uh, angle and then M can be taken as a horizontal rows that will give you the another angle. Okay, like that. Or you can take it as azimuth and elevation itself. So that was all about the radiation pattern of phased arrays. In the next video, we'll talk about beam steering and array feed networks. Okay, thank you.